everyone, and welcome to this month's Wildlife Wednesday Monthly Roundup. I'm Tenley Thompson. And I'm Tyler Greenlee. And Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures has lots of awesome videos to show you from all over the Great Yellowstone ecosystem this month. Let's go ahead and get started with everybody's favorite, bears. It is super rare in nature for two very similar species to coexist in the same habitat. Here in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, we have two species of bear. We have the American black bear and we have the grizzly bear. However, these two are different enough to coexist on the same landscape. The American black bear is the smaller of the two species and is the one that is more herbivorous and lives in a smaller area. Because of this, they can exist at higher population densities. They also occur more in thick forested environments, especially in areas that have trees that they can climb to avoid carnivores and competitors. Black bears also come in a larger variety of colors. They can be cinnamon or black like their name suggests, but they can also be blonde and even grayish in color. Grizzlies, on the other hand, can weigh twice as much as a black bear and are less agile when it comes to arboreal activities. They also tend to live in more open country. Grizzlies are also more monochromatic in color. They are usually brown with blonde tints to their fur. However, they can be quite dark in some cases or even orange. Both of these bear species are omnivorous. However, they have different specifics to their diet that allows them to avoid competition with each other. Black bears tend to be the more herbivorous of the two species. They usually live in more closed environments and they feed on understory vegetation and grasses. They are often, we often see them feeding on wildflowers actually. They also like to feed on a variety of forest insects. Grizzlies, on the other hand, seem to be more open country specialists, and they often use their long claws to dig up the roots and tubers found in open meadows and fields. They also are more carnivorous and feed a lot more on mammals than black bears do. In comparison, black bears don't move as far within their calendar year. They tend to live in a much smaller home range and feed on that local vegetation. When grizzlies and black bears encounter each other, there's usually a bit of aggression and it's usually the grizzly that dominates these situations. The only time a black bear would dominate a confrontation between the two species would be if the grizzly was a very young bear or a very small or weak bear. In any case, grizzlies do often predate on black bears. And in areas like British Columbia, where the ecosystems on, on the British Columbia islands are a lot smaller, grizzlies tend to dominate and they tend to competitive, competitively exclude black bears from those islands simply because there isn't enough space or enough food for them to get along. Here in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, there is enough landscape for the two of them to coexist, which means that we are one of the few places on Earth that has two species of bear coexisting in the same environment. Thanks everyone for tuning in to Wildlife Wednesday. My name is Tyler Greenlee, and if you have a question about bears, please leave that question in the comic section below and we'll be sure to answer that question later on in the broadcast. Thanks Tyler for that great update. Yeah, no problem, Tenley. So we're gonna start talking about another one of our favorite animals, an animal that we don't see a whole lot on tour, uh, the American pika, and we have Sarah Ernst today uh, here to talk about them. Hello, this is Sarah Ernst and I'm out on a hike in some rocky country just outside Grand Teton National Park. We are in the habitat of one of the most elusive and one of the most adorable animals in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the pika. So where do we go to see pikas in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? Well, any big pile of rocks at high elevation will often do, but what's more important is that temperature. Um, 
I would not look for pikas at anything over 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Have you ever been hiking in Grand Teton or Yellowstone National Park and heard something that sounded maybe like someone blowing on a party favor hidden deep in the rocks, a little meep sound? Maybe you catch a glimpse of an ashy gray animal running across the rock pile, and that would possibly be the pika. Uh, this is some excellent pika habitat right here. What makes this such good pika habitat is the pile of rocks behind me. This one happened during a landslide. You'll also see them up canyon walls and in the high country and uh, above the tree line. Wherever there's piles of rocks, you might find pikas here at higher elevations. They need these piles of rocks to elude predators. They're pretty skilled at darting in and out of the uh, paths they know so well. And also to store those hay piles they need to survive the winter. The average pika weighs about five, six ounces. That puts it at about the weight of a baseball. And they're about the size of a baseball too, maybe a softball for the bigger ones. Pikas look like a little furry rodent that you might find in a pet store, maybe a chinchilla, a guinea pig, but they're actually closely related to rabbits. They're in the lagomorph family. Other animals you might see in rock piles like these would be the golden mantle ground squirrel, the marmot, a much larger uh, furry critter out here. And we have a couple varieties of chipmunks as well. All of those animals hibernate for the winter, except for the pika. Now, when you've got a place with as winters as long as ours, six, seven months in the high country, that can be a big problem if you are trying to live off the land and you're covered with six feet of snow. So pikas, deal with our long snowy winters by gathering big piles of hay, which they cure out in the sun to stash underneath the rocks to use during the winter. Pikas spend half their lives in the darkness in these rock piles under deep layers of snow, eating the hay that they had stored over the summer. And that makes them one of the busiest animals here during our short snow-free months, trying to gather enough to survive. So we're starting to get a little bit worried about these beautiful but very sensitive animals. We're experiencing hotter and drier weather across the last couple of decades across the American West than we used to, and that's posing several survival threats to the pika. Hotter summer day temperatures keep pikas indoors for longer, meaning they can't be out there gathering the hay they need to survive the winter. It's also changing the type of vegetation they have access to. As we're seeing snow melt out earlier and the uh, pattern of plants alter across the ecosystem. Across some populations, such as the Great Basin population, pikas are retreating from lower elevation areas, uh, some by around a thousand feet. The problem is retreating to higher elevation areas, you eventually run out of room to go. Pikas are being monitored here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem to see if they're doing the same thing. Interestingly enough, there are some pikas that have been able to survive at low elevation in places like Craters of the Moon National Monument, where they use cool lava tubes to escape the heat of the 100 degree days that are found out there in the summer. Multi-day tours are often when we have time to stake out these pikas and try to uh, be able to film them and take pictures of them. They're definitely an elusive species, but boy, they're worth it. Aren't they adorable? This is Sarah Ernst with Ecotour Adventures signing off. Thanks, Sarah, so much for giving us all that great information about pikas. So next up, we're actually going to check out one of the places where pikas like to live, mm -hmm. the high elevation of the Wind Rivers. And we actually have Tenley presenting her hike that she did for her 40th birthday. While many people think of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as the area most close to Yellowstone National Park, it's actually a vast area of multiple mountain ranges that comprises the largest area of protected land in the lower 48 and certainly the most true wilderness land. 
While Yellowstone National Park with its hot springs, beautiful deep lakes is probably the most visited area of the park, I decided for my 40th birthday to go to an area that is some of the least visited, and that is the Wind River Range of Wyoming. This area, home to massive glaciers and the tallest mountain in Wyoming, Gannett Peak, is also home to the Bridger and Popo Aggie Wilderness. I'd like to talk a little bit more about wilderness areas by talking a little bit more about my trip to the most southern end of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem to visit an area on top of the Continental Divide called the Cirque of the Towers. This area of the Wind River Range has an area of mountains that go almost 360 degrees around at the top of the Continental Divide. It is a view unlike any other, but it is a view that takes some serious work to get there. Now this solo backpack I took was in a very special area which is called a wilderness area. You must hike in or out of wilderness areas. They're areas of land that have been largely undisturbed by human development. They usually lack roads, buildings, and other structures because they want to be in their natural state. Hunting, motorized vehicles, even mountain bikes are prohibited in wilderness. I hiked up through alpine meadows, through rushing streams, until I reached my first base camp, where I had some visitors, because horse packing is a permissible use of wilderness. You do have to be careful what you bring in, you must pack out, and you must be careful to hang all food out of reach of bears. Because the Wind River Range is in a wilderness area, the Bridger Teton and Popo Aggie Wilderness, there almost are no bridges and you must do the best you can with what you have. So here's a really good example of a typical creek crossing. Wish me luck. One of the most important parts of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem at altitude is the ecosystem situated around the white bark pine, as you can see some behind me. Sadly, all of these white bark pines are dead from a, a needle blight that has come over from Europe and has been heavily affecting white bark pines. White bark pines create an entire ecosystem. Grizzly bears are very reliant on their nuts, which they dig up from caches made by squirrels in the fall. Clark's nutcrackers have developed an entire life cycle around the tree, using the nuts and caching, and more importantly, remembering where they're caching. They're one of the most important birds in the ecosystem in that when they cache the nuts for squirrels and grizzlies to use. Kind of a neat thing, Clark's nutcrackers are one of the only species besides humans who can actually think about the future and plan. A Clark's nutcracker will actually reserve nuts for the remainder of the winter season by keeping track of how many it has left and begin to ration food if it doesn't have enough. Sadly, white bark pine trees like the ones you can see behind me are in big, big trouble. Over 80% of these high altitude trees have died in the last 30 years due to a pine needle blight. There is no cure and it's probably likely that they probably won't exist in the next 50 years. To touch a white bark pine tree is in many ways to touch the concept of time itself. Many of these trees were here long before European settlers Scientists are hard at work for a solution for the white bark pine tree, but just like Dutch elm disease with elm trees and the loss of the American chestnut before it, these forests will be far more still if they're unsuccessful. Good morning. So I'm out on day three of my Wind River backpack and today I'm going to attempt to get to the Cirque of the Towers, arguably the most famous area of the Wind River region. As you can sort of see behind me, all those beautiful wildflowers that were out yesterday all kind of got nailed in a hailstorm that I got caught in for about three hours. And I woke up this morning to snow around the tent. So you never want to forget that mountain weather can be really, really serious. Luckily, I was all snugly warm uh, in my nice warm sleeping bag. So I'll have some breakfast, get an early alpine start, and we'll see where we get to today. To get to the Cirque of the Towers, I climbed up and up and up, way above the tree line, to encounter some Krumholtz trees, which are famous subarctic trees that only live above the tree line. Because the snow rips the tops of the trees off, they grow low to the ground and are twisted and gnarled. Life abounds in the subalpine zone. You just have to know where to look for it. 
Still I traveled upwards until I reached the very top of Jackass Pass, moving from one area of the mountains to the Cirque of the Towers. Here we are, Jackass Pass, and there's the Cirque. Boy, that was some of the toughest 4.5 miles of mountain climbing I've ever done. And as you can see, I am surrounded by mosquitoes. But I did want to take a brief moment to talk a little bit about the really fascinating geology here at Cirque of the Towers. The Wind River Range is primarily composed of granite and granite schist, just like the Tetons. And granite is nothing more than cooled magma from deep under the Earth's surface. Some of the oldest Rocky Mountains are in the Wind River Range, about 2.5 billion years old. But those rocks flowed into some of the oldest rocks on the planet, 3.4 billion year old rock. Now, 600 million years ago, this was just the coastline of a giant inland sea. Then the Rocky Mountains began their uplift. There was a large, large drop of the old ocean floor and an uplift of the mountains. This then paused uncharacteristically of the Rocky Mountains and then was covered by sediment. Many, many millions of years later, the rocks uplifted again. But in the meantime, there had been erosion off of the tops of the peaks, which is what gives the characteristic flat tops of the Wind River Range. Finally, Several glaciations, starting about 250,000 years ago, carved the sharp peaks we know today, and ice flowed almost a thousand feet thick at one point. The cirque is so round and pointy because it is at the head of the tops of these glaciers that then flowed down into the mountains to create the V-shaped valleys we see today. Up here in the high country, snow is pretty common all the way into late July and August. As you can see, this big patch behind me is nowhere close to melting. After my journey of the Cirque of the Towers, it was time to make my way down, 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 back to the trees, back to the lakes and the mosquitoes, and back to the trailhead and the wide vistas of Wyoming. I certainly had a great time taking a couple days off to explore an area of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem that many visitors don't see, and I hope you enjoyed coming along with me. Well, thanks everybody for joining me for my 40th anniversary, anniversary, well, anniversary of my birth, 40th birthday uh, backpacking trip. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing a little bit of an area of the Tetons, the area of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, it's the Wind Rivers, not the Tetons, that you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise. And uh, you get an idea of how many mosquitoes were up there. Oh my gosh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but we were laughing. Occasionally one would fly across the screen. <laughs> There were a lot of mosquitoes up there, but I am told in like September, it's pretty mosquito free, but I do appreciate Eco Tour Adventures uh, giving me a couple days off to go and check that out. If you ever get a chance to go on a solo backpack on your own, I definitely highly recommend it. All right. So it's now time for my second favorite mm -hmm. part of the program, which is our trivia question of the month. Now our trivia master here, Tyler, has a good one for you this month. We do, of course, want to uh, tell you a little bit about how this is going to work. We're going to talk a little bit about last month's trivia question. Mm -hmm. If you think you know the answer, go ahead and let us know in the comment section. But we've already awarded the winter, the winner of last month's trivia. And then after that, we're going to show you this month's trivia question uh, for your chance to win. All you have to do to get a chance to win a gift card to our Ego Tour Adventures store is answer in the comment section what you think uh, the answer to the trivia question is. Yeah. Now, speaking of the <laughs> store, um, this is a good moment to talk about our item of the month. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but we sell gift cards on the Ecotour Adventure store. So normally on this show, we're talking about mugs and t-shirts and books and photographs and local art and crafts and what have you. But if you are wanting to give somebody a gift for a special um, event or holiday or what have you, we mm -hmm. definitely um, have gift cards along with all sorts of other great stuff. Definitely check it out. We'll get that um, web address for the Ecotour store up in the comment section. Um, we also, of course, uh, will accept donations to our guides. If you've enjoyed any of these videos that our guides shot 
this month for you guys to enjoy of the Greater Dallas Tunico system, throw them a couple dollars. It'll go straight towards their health insurance and other benefits. Uh, and we sure appreciate your support. Okay. Now the fun part. Yeah, trivia. Tyler, what, what do we got here? So last month we asked about grizzly bears. And here's the question. We asked what the most common food for grizzlies is. And the answers were grass, elk, berries, tourists. <laughs> Thank you all for um, attempting to answer this. And we definitely got some correct answers. Yep. So the answer is A, it's actually grass. So grizzly bears, the, the highest proportion of their diet is actually graminoids. And if you don't know what a graminoid is, that is a type of plant in the grass family. So that could be grasses, sedges, wheat is in the grass family. And what we see is we see grizzlies in these open meadows, especially early in the spring, grazing like cows, picking up sedge. If you ever watch a documentary from Alaska, like Kodiak or from Katmai National Park, you'll often see bears grazing on these, what almost look like golf courses up in Alaska. And they're actually areas of sedge that have been grazed down by grizzlies. Mm -hmm. And so a pretty high proportion of their diet actually can be grass, which is oftentimes That's pretty crazy. surprising. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. Thank you all for uh, commenting your answers. Um, definitely had some good ones there. So this month's trivia question goes along with our pika theme. And so here it is. So what is the temperature of a pika's body? Seems like a pretty simple answer. Um, I'll give you guys a hint. Animals definitely vary temperature-wise from humans, and typically smaller animals have a higher body temperature than people do, and that's because their metabolic rates tend to be higher, and that's uh, just because they're a smaller-bodied animal. Uh, smaller-bodied animals have a lower surface-to-volume ratio, and so to maintain their body heat and survive in cold climates, they have to keep their body temperature uh, sometimes a little higher than what we keep ours. So that's a nice little hint for you guys. Um, and <laughs> pikas are um, really temperature sensitive, just like what Sarah said. So imagine, you know, these tiny little animals living in the boulder fields in the middle of winter, um, surviving when the temperatures are sometimes negative 20. Awesome, guys. I see a lot of good answers there, a lot of correct answers. Yeah. And if you guys want to think about that for a little bit and maybe go back and look at the question, uh, once the broadcast ends, you can just scroll on back to that question there. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, friendly reminder, if you're watching this video and it's been shared or it's not coming from the original Jacksonville Ecotour Adventure source and you choose to answer on that video, we won't necessarily see it. So make sure you come back to the Jacksonville Ecotour Adventures original mm -hmm. Wildlife Wednesday video and answer for your chance to win. Yes. We don't want anybody to miss out on a chance for that no. gift card. <laughs> um, all right. So we will give you the answer for the August 2022 trivia question next month. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, it's time for my favorite part of the program, yeah. which is that Tyler and I are here to answer your questions live. So if you have a question for a naturalist, anything you can think of, we will attempt to answer. Every once in a while, I get stumped. Every once in a while, somebody asks me one, and I go, I'm, I'm not sure on the I answer I feel like we've that. been pretty good. Like, the past, yeah. like, couple broadcasts have been, we've been able to answer pretty much all of them. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys to try and stump yeah. us this month. See what you can do. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> look, what's really wonderful is Tyler knows all sorts of things about the natural world that I don't know. Uh, and vice versa. So, definitely make sure you stump him with, like, a nerdy bird question. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Because I won't know the answer to that, but he definitely will. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. We're going to go in the order in which we receive them. If you see us looking down, it's because we're looking at our iPad and answering live here. So that's what that's about. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll get started. Oh, look here. at all the answers. Yeah. Let's see here. Dan asks, how large is a bear's territory normally? You want this one? Yeah, yeah. great question. So an animal's territory is going to be dependent largely on how good its habitat is. And so in areas in the tropics, animals' territories are going to be a lot smaller than in colder regions, like in the temperate zones, which is where we're at. And so for some bears that live in places like India, Southeast Asia, South America, their home ranges are going to be smaller. Now here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, our grizzlies have incredibly large 
home ranges. Some of our grizzlies will range over a thousand square kilometers. Um, our famous grizzly, Grizzly Bear 399, ranges throughout Jackson Hole in an area that is over a thousand square kilometers, which is very impressive. And male bears, and this is very typical for male carnivores, male grizzlies range even further, sometimes over three times the range of a female. Um, there's one particular male grizzly that comes down and mates with all the females here in the Tetons, and he's been recorded all the way up along the Firehole River near Old Faithful. That's insane! Which is ridiculous. Yeah. So we drive that on tour. It takes us like, oh gosh, sometimes like two, two hours. Yeah. And it's, and like the terrain they have to go over, or he has to go over to reach the Tetons is pretty incredible. He goes over the Pitchstone Plateau, which is a big lava flow that happened around 500,000 years ago. And so he has to actually go up and over almost a mountain or a plateau to reach the Tetons and the females down here. But he still thinks that's his territory. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, so yeah, and bears often have these huge home ranges because they rely on very seasonal food. And so in the spring, you'll find them at lower elevations and then they'll migrate super high up into the mountains. In the case of the males, they'll go where the females are. Um, I think, what do you think, Tenley? I, I kind of feel like he comes down to the Tetons because there's not a lot of competition yeah. from other grit, from there other There are grizzlies. very, very few large mm -hmm. male grizzlies in Grand Teton National Park. And that's simply because Grand Teton National Park is relatively recently the home to as many grizzly bears as mm -hmm. we have. When I was a little girl, and remember, I'm celebrating my 40th birthday, so that tells you how old I am, uh, we had no grizzlies in Grand Teton. We'd have an occasional visitor. We'd rarely see them. They were possible. But by the time um, I was 16, 17 years old, we began to see grizzlies routinely in Grand Teton, and we began to have grizzlies living here. Mm -hmm. So we do now have quite a few female grizzlies, in part thanks to very prolific mothers like 399, mm -hmm. but we still don't have a lot of large, mature males. And so if you're a smart male bear, you'll come yeah. in from some of the wilderness areas, national forests, and even Yellowstone National Park, and, um, you know, have all the lady bears that you might wish to have uh, coming down here in Grand Teton. So pretty clever, yeah. actually, when you think about it. On the MPS website for Yellowstone, you can actually look at the range expansion of grizzlies. It's quite impressive. It's almost like a big mushrooming effect. It's like a mushroom cloud growing out over Yellowstone. The epicenter is in Yellowstone, and then it spreads out from there. We now have grizzlies south of Jackson Hole, which is, which is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Um, there are areas where grizzlies haven't existed for, oh gosh, a hundred yeah, plus years. That we're now seeing them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was all the way in the southern aspects of the Greylstone ecosystem uh, on my four-day backpack at the Cirque of the Towers. And they're just occasionally beginning to see the occasional grizzly even down there. So while mm -hmm. I was mostly storing my food from black bears, who've become pretty savvy down there, we're beginning to get grizzlies down into... Uh, central western Wyoming, which is a really, really big deal. Um, basically, from about 1965, 1966, when they were listed on the Endangered Species Act, till today, um, that's a very, very short period of time for such an impressive recovery. Grizzlies were mm -hmm. one of the first animals listed on the Endangered Species Act. They're one of the inaugural first class, so to speak. And so as we get to the point where we're beginning to see populations get to the point where we can consider delisting, um, a lot of questions about yeah. their future and how we're going to take mm -hmm. care of them so that my children and grandchildren will have an opportunity to enjoy bears just like we can today. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if you're in an area that has black bears, black bears live in a much smaller territory compared to grizzlies. And that's because they're smaller bodied and they're more herbivorous, as I said earlier in the bear video. Great question. Yeah, yeah. very good question. Um, okay, I'm going to do this one real quick because I think it's an easy one. Don asked, who is Craig Thomas, whose name is on the Discovery Center? Um, that's a really, really good question. So for those of you guys who've never been to visit Grand Teton National Park, we have what I think of as the new visitor center, um, <laughs> which was uh, inaugurated in 2007. So I don't mm -hmm. think it's actually that new, but it's new to in my, in my mind. Uh, and it's called the Craig Thomas Discovery Center. So Craig Thomas, first and foremost, was a United States Senator from the state of Wyoming. He passed away in 2007, um, but he served in Congress for a very, very long time. I want to say well over, 
uh, 15, 20 years. Long wow. time senator from Wyoming. And he was known for his willingness to compromise, to bring um, sort of the extremists of both parties together to find consensus on issues they could agree about. He was much beloved by Wyomingites. Wyoming is a, a state that feels very strongly, uh, has that cowboy culture. You know, you take care yeah. of yourself and you take care of your own and you take care of your neighbors. Um, and everybody takes care of everybody. And we might not all agree, but we all agree that we have a, a reason for being here. Well, okay. So, and, and that's glorified cowboy culture, by the way. There's, there's positive and negatives yeah. to every, <laughs> every way of being. But Craig Thomas was a big believer in that and bringing people sort of to the center. And, and Wyoming legislators are kind of famous for that historically. Um, our, our legislators oftentimes do sort of sit um, in a compromising position with compromising position. That sounds bad, but I mean a place where they bring people together, uh, to come to an agreement to, you know, in, in both the house and the Senate historically, mm -hmm. if you kind of look back and, um, he worked his entire career to bring a new visitor center to Grand Teton National Park. Um, and he worked to provide funding for that. Our visitor center used to be an elaborate kind of double wide trailer, uh, when I was a little girl that leaked Gosh. terribly uh, and there was almost no room in it. Um, there was a, a bookstore that was about the size of a closet and there was a tiny little movie theater with like a little TV and then there was a, um, a Kodiak like an Alaskan brown bear. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, in the visitor center, which I didn't know better when I was a little We're kid. We're both naturalists, so, like, that's offensive to us. That's offensive yeah. to us, right? We don't have Kodiaks <laughs> here, but I think somebody maybe shot it back in, like, the 60s and then donated it to Grand Teton. Well, so... and if you think, like, grizzly bears are endangered, they, they're not going to put a grizzly bear in the right. discovery That center. would be a little rough, yeah. right? And it had a stuffed mm. trumpeter swan in there, too. If, <laughs> yeah, just totally random memories of this. But uh, if you'd like to see the Kodiak bear that formerly hung or is, was in, in a case in the visitor center. It actually still is in Grand Teton National Park. Is it really? Yeah, I saw it the other day. It is up at Jackson Lake Lodge in their lobby, and the swan is there too. So you could actually oh go gosh. and see it. Um, but yeah, where that former visitor center was, if you happen to visit Grand Teton National Park, if you drive into Moose, directly opposite, across the road from the new visitor center, is what was the old visitor center, which is now administrative offices. So they put it to good use. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is Craig Thomas was successful in fundraising, I want to say somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of the eventual wow. visitor center was raised federally. The rest was raised through the Grand Teton Foundation um, and Grand Teton Association and private dollars built that beautiful, beautiful visitor center. One of my favorite national park visitor centers in the system. It's One gorgeous. of the problems we face in the national park system is so much of our infrastructure was built uh, during the recovery from the Great Depression. And the Civilian Conservation Corps built a lot of the roads, a lot of the infrastructure, and a lot of the visitor centers in the National Park Service system. Certainly not the Grand Teton National Visitor Center. That one was built later. Mm -hmm. But that infrastructure has aged dramatically. And so the Park Service has a real backlog of repairing and replenishing a lot of these visitor centers. A lot of those interpretive displays um, are just simply out of date. So our new visitor center, which has been around since 2007, so I have to yeah. stop calling it new, I suppose, at this point. <laughs> new well worth a visit. It has a, it has a <laughs> video river and like the floor, and it's got this great exhibit on climbing history. And you can see um, some of the climbing gear from the first climbers. And mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh, so many cool things. So definitely check it out. Whenever I drive past it on tour, I always joke that it's the Tony Stark's vacation home. Yeah. <laughs> because it, people will ask me, who owns that? Is that someone's mansion? And I'm like, it's no. It's beautiful. That's I'll try to post a center. photo yeah. of the visitor center. <laughs> it's beautiful. One of the things the Park Service is trying to do in what they call the new millennium of building, so since 2000, is they're mm -hmm. trying to match the architecture and the infrastructure of the park to the place, mm -hmm. to provide place-based architecture. So almost all national park building up until the year 2000 was based on one national park building. Does anybody know what it is? A very famous national park building. We actually plan to feature it next month. Yeah. Um, and that's the dark lodgepole pine log of Old Faithful Inn. That dark wood, you know, the dark brown painted um, entry signs into national parks or those log cabiny looking buildings. They make sense in somewhere like Yellowstone, but yeah. they make zero sense in 
Arches National Park or... Or I was um, thinking like Everglades. Or Everglades or, like or Joshua Sequoia. Tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they still have used that architecture. And so now as they build new structures in the national parks, they're working really hard to make those structures reflect the local culture, the local architectural traditions, and mm -hmm. the local uh, the color scheme. So like if you go to Arches, their visitor center... Um, is sandstone in construction and it's it's yellows and oranges and reds that kind of match the rock walls and it's got big huge um, natural air cooling systems because it's very hot there yeah. it's not a log dark brown cabin uh, because they're not doing that anymore and of course the Grand Teton Visitor Center because it's one of the new ones has these mm -hmm. beautiful two-story three-story windows uh, that face, of course, the Teton Range. And when you drive past the building, the building almost is shaped like the Tetons. Yes. Yeah. It's really cool. I don't know who the architect was. I'll have I to know, look it up, it's but it's, beautiful. it's very cool. Okay, enough about our visitor center. If you ever get a chance to visit it, well worth your time. Um, but hopefully that answers your question on who the heck Craig Thomas was. Really, really interesting guy. Well worth looking up his history. Um, let's see. Oh, boy. This is a nice long one, Mark. Tell me first off, happy birthday. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I've been seeing on similar pages, people are concerned about tourists picking berries, mushrooms, etc. that help sustain the wildlife. I believe you discussed something about this. What if anything is being done to restore natural food sources that could be lost due to visitors, weather, or anything else? That's a good one. That's a really good one. Yeah, so... Berries, uh, so animals, yes, depend on these natural resources. A lot of these natural resources are very seasonal. So mushrooms and berries, for example, are super seasonal. And I mean, anything from like a squirrel to a bear does depend on those food resources. Typically what we're seeing is that in most areas, we're having very low human influence. Um, usually we're not seeing huge crowds collecting berries or mushrooms, except for in specific areas. Um, I'm actually not sure of any, any parks that are mitigating against that. So there are a couple of rules. So as, so they're not stopping people from going out and collecting things, but they typically stop people from commercially using yeah. these resources. And so one of the concerns the park has is that someone would come in from outside the park and collect all of these berries and mushrooms. Um, mushrooms uh, that grow in the national forest are often sold in restaurants in Jackson and that they would be commercially used. And that is definitely concerned. The park is not for commercial use generally. Um, and so the park doesn't really want people to disturb those resources yeah. for commercial value. They do allow, I believe, up to a quart of berries per Correct. person to be taken out of Grand Teton. Yellowstone's a little more loose as far as its rules, um, but they do update them every single year. And with every single new superintendent that comes into office. They change their mind. <laughs> yeah, they change their mind often. And so, you know, I would say as far as how humans are affecting these natural resources, I'd say we still have a lot to learn. Yeah. In areas like Jenny Lake, um, that's a very high traffic area, those berries get picked over very quick. Yeah. There's a waterfall in Yellowstone called Moose Falls that gets picked over pretty quick berries-wise. And so locally, it's definitely an issue. But as far as the overreaching I mean, the entirety of the national, or of the forest. It's not going to have a huge ecological impact, right. except for these very localized areas. I'm not here to inflict my opinion on you guys. I never am. I'm here mm -hmm. to give you the facts and let you generate your own opinion. Um, so now that I've said that, I might have an opinion on this. Okay. If you guys are willing to bear with me. Uh, I'm curious. Oh, yeah, right? Yeah. So it, it's <laughs> tricky because if there was too much resource extraction going on, it would have a ne negative impact on wildlife. And I, let's be clear. This is not as well studied as we would hope. They mm -hmm. do have some areas in certain national parks in California. I'm trying to remember. I think it's like Redwood and Sequoia yeah. where there is some concern here. And certainly extractive um, harvesting is not the goal of the National Park Service. That said, um, historically, the kind of people that are going and picking a quart of huckleberries to make huckleberry jam tend to be local people who huckleberries only grow in the wild. They're very, very annoying to harvest. You can't just mm -hmm. go in with a rake and take them by the gazillions. Um, and so there is an ethical way to do this that allows food for birds, for wildlife, for bears, and does allow what humans are, are built and engineered to do, which is hunting and gathering, right? So I have picked many, a, you know, a bucket of huckleberries um, from when I was a little girl. 
uh, and made Huckleberry Jam for everybody for Christmas or whatever, whatever. But I'm being very selective where I'm only taking maybe a quarter of berries on that bush so that the birds and the bears have plenty and then I'm moving on to the next bush. If you do it in an ethical way, um, you know, mushrooms, for instance, the vast majority of the organism is under the ground when you're picking that fruiting body yeah. you're not keeping it you're not taking it away forever if you pick a flower for instance particularly root parasite flower like indian paintbrush it's gone forever um and that would be really extractive but mushrooms replenish themselves to mm -hmm. some extent so there is a way to do this ethically and there is a way to do this intelligently that allows humans wildlife everybody who wants to participate in gathering resources to be able to do it in national parks, but it needs to be for personal use. Um, and right now, Grand Teton does a really nice job restricting yeah. the amount that people can take out where you wouldn't possibly you be able to do. It. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, I will point out that the National Forest System is the land of many uses and extractive use, whether it be mountaintop mining or picking of, you know, raspberries or huckleberries or anything else is actually considered a viable use of that landscape, whether mm -hmm. you agree or disagree. And so there are people who do commercially pick uh, in those places. Um, but yeah, when I was a little girl, uh, as a teenager, you know, and as an elementary school age kid, that was a great way to make a little extra money in the summer was go pick some huckleberries yeah. on the National Forest. People uh, get really, really protective of their spots, though. They do. They, it's like territorial. They get yeah. territorial. Oh, yeah. It's like you can't tell anyone. They'll you never tell anybody. Very select friends to those spots. Yeah. You never <laughs> tell anybody, like, where your favorite place to go pick morels is. And you yeah, never like... tell anybody where your favorite place to go pick huckleberries is. Um, and you don't ask people either. That's, that's like an volunteered. insulting thing. Yeah. So there's a little Jackson Hole Western <laughs> culture for you. But great, great question for sure. And as far as these resources... You know, a lot of the animals come through. So for grizzly bears are a, are a great example, and they'll use the resource and then leave, and they'll yeah. be there for like a day. And actually, the berries and mushrooms will return. The berries don't all fruit at, or don't all ripen at once. They'll ripen over a period of a couple weeks, and so the bears will come through, and or people will come through. Eat, eat or collect the ripe ones and then new ones will take their place. And mushrooms will definitely replace themselves. Yeah. There's a right a way frame. and a wrong way to do it. And if mm -hmm. you're doing it the right way, it as long seems as there's enough. like people not constantly yeah. coming in or you're not constantly coming to the same spot for weeks on end, then the then the forest will recover. One day it might change, but for now we seem to be doing pretty well. Yeah. Something we should study some more though, for sure. Let's see here. Yeah, there's not a lot of studies on Speaking it. Speaking of huckleberries, <laughs> this is great. Um, have either of you been to the City Creamery in West Yellowstone and tried their huckleberry ice cream? I keep hearing raves about this unique flavor from locals and visitors alike. Oh, huckleberry. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> it's better than blueberry ice cream, yeah. in my opinion. Oh, way better. <laughs> way better. Way better. For those of you guys wondering what a huckleberry tastes like, we are in the middle of huckleberry season right now. Mm -hmm. Imagine you take a raspberry and a blueberry, and then you add like a tablespoon of sugar, like yeah. way more sweet, and then you mash them all together and you eat it. That is it's a very concentrated. <laughs> and it looks a little bit like a purple blueberry. And they're about, I mean, they're smaller than your pinky yeah. nail. So they're, they're tiny. I've never yeah. eaten a berry that's got more sugar in it. I mean, they are like Fruit Loops. Uh... <laughs> I think, okay, and you'll, you'll have to bear with me on this. So, bear with you. So, exactly. <laughs> no, that's berry seed. So there's one berry in the GYE that I think tastes better. Oh, what, what? And it's a close relative. Okay. It's the grouse wardleberry. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. But yes. they're impossible to collect. Yeah. They're impossible to collect because they're like the size of a pinhead. Yeah. But it's like eating Skittles. They're so sweet. Yeah. It's like It's funny how candy. wild berries have so much more sugar, a lot of them, than cultivated berries do. Um, people have tried for a really long time to figure out how to grow huckleberries domestically. And no one's ever been successful. Um, there seems to be a combination yeah. of drainage, soil type, north-facing slopes. There's sort of all sorts of elements to it that make it really complicated. Yeah. I know there is a place in Colorado where it's private property where a huge amount of the huckleberries produced in the United States for like huckleberry products like chocolates and you know soaps and all the lotions and things you see come from where there's a guy who just has a massive side of a mountain just covered in huckleberries that he uses he to do that them? and he collects them but they are wow. wild grown he's not he's not growing them so That's crazy. really really fascinating um to answer your question about the ice cream i have not eaten at that specific ice cream place because i'm not 
usually getting ice cream in West Yellowstone, but I have, of course, eaten the Huckleberry ice cream at our own Jackson Moose Gourmet. Yes. Um, and I've also had it at our local, local Hagen Dazs. They both have Huckleberry mm-hmm. ice cream. And oh my gosh, it's so good. You have it's not lived delicious. till you had Huckleberry ice cream. It's so good. If you good. come to Jackson, it's required that you get yeah, Huckleberry like ice cream. Yeah, like it's mandatory Huckleberry yes. ice cream. <laughs> Um, and, uh, if you really get an opportunity, in my opinion, the world's best Huckleberry ice cream, uh, is actually in, uh, Victor at the Victor Emporium. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So right over the, right over the backside of the Tetons, um, their Huckleberry milkshakes are okay. unbelievable. So if you're driving from the West, make sure you definitely stop at the Victor Emporium for like a whole bunch of reasons. The whole place is just a hoot. Uh, but the, oh boy, those talking very much. I've actually never been there. So. It's worth driving over the pass just for that. Cool. <laughs> Maybe not at the gas prices we're paying right now, but you know, something along those lines. All right, let's see. What do we got here? Um, ooh, that's for you. Ooh, any out of the ordinary bird scene? You have no idea how happy you just oh made. Oh my him. gosh, this is so. I just I gave a tour last week where we saw 51 bird species. Yeah. It was a birding specific. In four tour. hours, right? In four hours. 51 it was birds. Crazy. One one thing that's really cool about this time of year is that a lot of our breeding birds are actually done breeding. Birds end, you know, their breeding season pretty early at the end of June, mid-July-ish. And then they kind of start floating on south. And so we're getting a couple of cool migrants. Uh, we saw a fox sparrow on that tour, which I think was my favorite bird. We're also starting to get our rufous hummingbirds, which is Ooh, super exciting. Yeah. A lot of our super rare, unusual species, though, we see oftentimes during migration. So that would be from like September, October-ish, and then also April until about early June. And so a couple examples of those would be like broad-winged hawks. I've never seen one. I know that there was one in Yellowstone this spring, and I was dying to see it. Um, And in the winter, we also get like snow buntings and boreal owls and rare birds that come down from the north. Um, as far as recently, we're starting to get, you know, our summer migrants. So Rufus, Rufus hummingbirds, fox sparrows, um, common loons are beginning to show up. Yeah. And, oh, apparently, and I won't tell anyone where it is, but apparently there's a pair of red necked grebes Mm -hmm. that are breeding in Yellowstone and they have successfully raised chicks. What? They've successfully raised chicks. And so they're not quite fledged yet, but they're still alive. Oh, I bet the park doesn't want to know where anybody where that is. Oh, wow. no, no. So we don't give locations on our broadcast, but we do get some pretty rare birds. Yeah, and I hadn't even heard about that. Yeah. So that's so, huge. Super exciting. Very cool. Yeah. And huh. so, I mean, rare birds show up at any time of the year. Like sometimes like long-tailed ducks will fly in mm-hmm. from the coast and be at like Lake Jackson and yeah. stuff like that. A couple of years ago, there was a long-tailed duck there. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, birds that are, um, quote unquote, more common for us, but rare for the rest of the country, birds we're kind of famous yes. for. Um, mm-hmm. In the spring, we get harlequin ducks, which is a seabird that comes all the way uh, into the mountains here, particularly in Yellowstone. We are, of course, famous here for the largest population of trumpeter swans in the world, and they're mm-hmm. actually quite easy to see here. Um, a bird you can see relatively easily here that most people get pretty excited about because they can't see it in other places, Swainson's hawks, for instance. Um, great gray owls. We have, Mm -hmm. um, the largest population of those here in the world. Um, yeah. A long-billed curlews. Oh yeah, of course. They look like Dr. Seuss birds. Yes. And avocets as well. Mm -hmm. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. We have, we have, we have nesting long-billed curlews now, which I just really, really love long-billed curlews. I'll have to put a photo of them in the comment section so you guys can see why I'm so obsessed. And you keep hoping that one of them is going to turn into the Eskimo curlew. Yeah. I had a professor in college (laughs) who was a very, very old man back when I was in college, so I don't know if he's still with us. Uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who uh, was a world-renowned ornithologist, and, and he posited a theory that the Eskimo curlew, which is one of the seven species of bird that's gone extinct here in the United States, was not, in fact, inst- extinct. Um, he thought that ivory-billed woodpeckers and Eskimo curlew still existed. Nobody has seen an Eskimo curlew, I believe, since 1953. It's been a while. It's been a while. But Mm -hmm. I I have to tell you, if I saw a long-billed curlew and an Eskimo curlew in flight, 
I'm not sure I'd be able to tell them apart. I think if they were sitting side by side, I could do it. Um, but he told me in college, I was sitting in lecture and it was like 6 a.m. and I was half asleep and this woke me right up. And he said, I think long-billed curlews still are around. I think they're in, I'm sorry, I think long-billed curlews definitely are still around. I think Eskimo curlews are still around and I think they're living in mixed flocks with long-billed curlews and if they exist anywhere left on the planet they'd be in Grand Teton National Park. Now I'm sitting there in Madison, Wisconsin going wait what? what? That's where so, I'm from. <laughs> right. Ever since then, every single time I see a group of long-billed curlews, I double check, right? Because I want to be the one who discovers that long-lost Eskimo curlew. Um, not quite sure about their name. It's a, Eskimo is not exactly a polite name to speak of the Inuit people these days. So we might need to change their name from something other than that. But boy, wouldn't that be neat if we yeah. rediscovered them? Look, I've been looking my entire career. I've yet to see one. Uh, but who knows? Maybe it's After possible. After you told me this, I've been looking. Now, right. So. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, if, if somebody who up. knows more than I will ever know in my lifetime about ornithology thinks it's possible, check it out. Next time you're in Grand Teton yeah. and you see any long-billed curlews, just double check. Make sure there's not an Eskimo curlew in there as well. So great question for sure. That was fun. Um, oh, here's one. Okay. How many cubs has 399 had? And how many cubs uh, do you think are, are out there from 399's family tree? Um, that's a great question. Has she basically populated the territory? Is that one of the reasons we now have grizzly hmm. um, you know, populations as we do? Lee, that is a great, a great, great question. question. Um, you want this one or you want me to take it? Well, I'm trying to remember the cub counts. I know. And it's, this it's is something debatable. that's debated. Right. Um, 17, 18 is usually what I, I say. I was about to say 18. Yeah. But depending she, on how you want to argue it. She definitely has more descendants than that because she has grand cubs and great grand cubs. I believe it's in the 20s. Yeah. As far as what we know. I think 26. I think so. Yeah. I think that's what After I After the cubs being. that were born this spring. I've been thinking I need to make like a 399 family tree for our office anyway. Yeah. Uh, that'd be great. And that would help. Yeah. But that's not all surviving. They're not all still alive. Uh, and then, yeah, so 399 is, is one of the, one of a couple bears, but one of the most important bears in terms of repopulating Grand Teton. We were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, she's made an enormous impact, her offspring. And then her most prolific female offspring, Grizzly Bear 610, mm -hmm. has been quite prolific as well. Uh, and we owe a great debt of gratitude to them in terms of they have really made Grand Teton the grizzly mecca that it is today. Um, but, um... How many, I think, are out there from 399's family tree? 610 is the only female descendant who is successfully having cubs. She's, well, there's 926 oh, well, now, 926. but she's the granddaughter. So, like, directly from 399. Yeah, I mean, 610. 610. And then 926 is the daughter of 610, right. I believe. So, yeah. a couple of females, but generally they have very low survival rates. Yeah. And so, locally, uh, we have a couple of females that have survived. Grizzly bears disperse over huge distances, so it's very possible that some of her offspring could be living in other areas where they're not visible and reproducing successfully. Yeah. Uh, one of her offspring from two litters ago went all the way to Red Lodge, yeah. which is across in all of Yellowstone. Um, and so they do travel huge distances and it's just impossible to keep our eyes out on every single one of these bears. One of, it's two of her quadruplets, uh, mm -hmm. from the last batch, um, traveled south, mm -hmm. uh, and one unfortunately was euthanized this month, uh, for getting into, uh, human food and it's been a very controversial thing. Um, mm -hmm. but the other one, the last time they saw it was in the wind river range just yeah. outside. So, mm -hmm. uh, remember I was talking about how grizzlies are just starting to go down there while one of her offspring is making their way down there. Yeah. So we have, we have one offspring that's all the way in the northernmost parts of the Great Yellowstone ecosystem and another offspring that's all the way in the, in the southernmost southern. parts of the Great Yellowstone ecosystem. And she sort of sits smack dab in the middle. So these male grizzlies, we already talked about have these big territories, um, are, are definitely spreading out a little bit more. It's not uncommon for her to have male offspring raise them to adulthood and we never see them again. But that doesn't mean that they've died. It just means that they've gone and lived mm -hmm. really, really deep in the wilderness. I just watched a video from Alberta, Canada of a grizzly bear, same as what we have down here, who in his fourth years dispersed over 500 miles. Yeah. Um, wow. And then was also, also euthanized because he ended up in human development, was way outside of the mountains, 
um, but they can travel huge distances, especially when they're young and searching for new territories. That's super common. Uh, one thing to note is that a lot of 399's offspring are male, and it's almost impossible to track how many offspring those male grizzlies have. And so, I mean, her descendants are definitely in the 20s, but yeah. likely higher, to, just based off of what we don't know. Yeah. Really, really great yeah. question for sure. Now, Grand Teton is kind of, you know, when we were talking about the expan the expanding population of grizzlies, Grand Teton, especially northern Grand Teton, is kind of right next to that grizzly bear ep epicenter. And so we do get a lot of other bears that utilize the northern part of Grand Teton that are unrelated to the 399 lineage. Um, we have 793 who comes down and she's unrelated. Yep. Um, one and of then my favorites. One of her, yep. And then apparently there's been a grizzly with two cubs mm -hmm. in northern Grand Teton yeah. and no one knows no, who but she is. No one has a clue. No one has a and clue. I wish I could tell you that this happens all the time. This does not happen all the time. Yeah. It's really exciting. So we're, we're hopeful mm -hmm. maybe we have a new dynasty in the making. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. And, and nobody has a clue. And, I, you know, look, I, it, we make it sound like we know who every grizzly is everywhere. And we don't. But there are bears that are hanging out in areas that are heavily used by people that we get to know over the decades. Mm -hmm. And so to have a new one yeah. is, is incredibly exciting. Super exciting. Very, very cool. All right. So let's see here. Oh, look at this. Bonnie says, when I was a baby, my folks were blueberry picking on our land in huge bushes. My mom thought she was talking to my dad. <laughs> Finally, when she asked him a question, his answer came from a different bush. And yet the bush was she was picking was moving because oh it gosh. was a bear. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. That's crazy. Oh. That's amazing. You're Where... telling me this right before I go harvest huckleberries. I know. I'm like, it's huckleberry season. <laughs> we need to be prepared. Tenley, bring your bear spray. I'll bring my bear spray. Bring, bring the bear spray. Oh, my gosh. That's where was this? I'm, yeah, I, I'm totally I definitely curious. want to know where the heck this was. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. You don't have to tell us about your secret blueberry Yeah, I don't patch. want to know exactly. Just like, give us the state or something yeah. or town. Yeah. <laughs> We'd never be so rude. Exactly. Now you know the etiquette. Yeah. Um, oh, Libby says, you should come here. We get thousands of broad hawks during my uh, oh. I've never seen so a broad-winged cool. hawk, and I've... I've always wanted to see one, and every spring I'm hoping that this will be, it'll be the year that I get to see a broad-winged. Um, maybe I just need to travel back east yeah. and do a bird-watching vacation and get all the eastern birds. Yeah, go to one of those hawk watch. <laughs> oh, man, that'd be great. Um, Ingrid says, what's the best time of year to see great gray owls in Yellowstone and the Tetons? Great question. Yeah, so the best time of year would be uh, generally starting in August all the way until about November when roads begin to close. Yeah. And so during the summer, especially the early summer, great grays disappear because they go to breed and they go often to higher elevations and to secluded secretive areas and they're not easy to find. But after the breeding season, they begin to disperse and spread out across the landscape again. And there's more of them because they've just had babies. Yep. And they're a lot easier to see. So generally, August to, to November is the best time to see great grays. Uh, as it gets colder, they become more active during the days and are easier to spot. And great grays, you want to look in habitat that is what I jokingly call a mess. Yes. <laughs> you, want, you want habitat that's a mess. So, lots, so river bottoms, riparian habitat, lots of fallen trees and snapped over snags, lots of great nesting habitat. Mm -hmm. Somewhere you'd never want to try to walk because there's so much no. deadfall um, where they can blend in really, really well. They and Wherever the mosquitoes are really nasty is going to be great, great gray owl habitat. They look exactly like bark. Yeah. So sometimes when you're looking for great grays, if you think you're in good habitat, just stop and stand and just like mm -hmm. look for like 10 minutes in all directions because yep. they're incredibly camouflaged. Yep. They can be super hard to spot. Yep. And they love... One of the easiest ways that I find to find them is they love looking for rodents as they scurry across roadways. Yeah. So if you kind of look halfway up trees near road areas in riparian habitat with lots of dead snags, mm -hmm. oftentimes that's where I see a lot of them. The other place I see a lot of them is on power poles. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Um, if you just look at the tops of power poles, it's amazing how many birds you'll find. But great yeah. grails are great for that. So <laughs> great question. Um... Oh, great question. Have they gotten to the bear-proof garbage cans for residents yet? Kind of. <laughs> what is taking so long? Oh, my gosh. So, okay. So, for those of you guys who are not involved in local bear trash can politics, because why would you be? Um, 399, that famous grizzly we were talking about earlier, decided to walk through the town of Jackson last year. 
uh, which I had all of us realize as this grizzly territory is expanding, we've been talking about that, uh, maybe we need to have bear-proof trash cans in Jackson. In mm -hmm. Teton County, which is where Grand Teton National Park and part of Yellowstone are located, if you live places outside of the town of Jackson, so for instance, the west bank of the Snake River Teton Village um, and the like, you do have to have um, bear-resistant trash cans. I don't want to call them bear-proof because some bears can get into them, but the vast yeah. majority can't. Uh, but the town of Jackson was always considered somewhere a grizzly wouldn't go until last year when... Until they came right through the square. <laughs> grizzly, yeah, a grizzly 399 and her four quadruplets just wandered through town like it was no big deal. So um, this created impetus that we really needed to do better. Become that as well as the fact that um, grizzly 399's offspring have come to some harm from getting into... Uh, non-secured human food, and that's part of the reason that, that one of those cubs was most recently euthanized. Um, there's been a lot of outcry that we need to do a better job as a community. The problem is we don't have any laws in Wyoming that prohibit the feeding of wildlife, so to speak. Uh, however, grizzly bears are a federally protected species, so they sort of sit in this interesting gray area. Uh, we do have a local county ordinance <laughs> that doesn't allow for wildlife feeding, whether it's from a garbage can or on purpose, with the exception of things like birds, but it's, it hasn't been enforced. There's been no way to sort of enforce it. So um, there was a homeowner just outside Grand Teton National Park that was purposefully feeding grizzly bears, including 399 and her offspring. So people really want to put a stop to this. They did build a wildlife ordinance that creates wildlife proof trash cans in the town of Jackson as a requirement. And then when they looked at it, they realized that it might be so strict, it wouldn't allow people to do things like feed birds in a bird feeder. So they decided that they need to go back and look a little harder at it. Um, and I was joking at the time, they needed to just look at other uh, other communities that have issues yeah. with bears and just copy their ordinances. Um, Whistler has an amazing one. Like Tahoe has a very good one. Just literally take the whole thing, the whole ordinance, <laughs> copy it, and put it into place, and we probably would be fine. Uh, so I couldn't understand what was taking so long, and I was whining about that on this program. Uh, the latest is that they created a committee. The committee is much, much closer to this. We expect uh, that we will have full passage in the fall. Everybody's kind of come to a conclusion. It will still allow for things like feeding birds and bird feeders, but the bird feeders will have to be hung out of the reach of bears, which mm -hmm. um, bird seed is an incredibly viable and valuable food source for grizzlies, particularly yeah. as they're preparing for fall. So that's important. Um, and it's not like we don't already have those ordinances in Teton County. We do in places like Teton Village. So it would just take those same rules and, and adapt them to town. Uh, meanwhile, there is a nonprofit that got started up that is providing bear resistant trash cans to citizens living in the town of Jackson who don't have the means to buy one of those trash cans for free. Um, you do have to prove your income level because bear proof trash cans are very, very expensive. I just bought two brand new ones for our office at Ecotour okay. uh, and we paid, I think, 350 bucks a piece for Ooh. each of them. So they're not cheap. Um, but we also have a rental program through our local trash companies as well. I think oh, cool. you pay five or eight dollars extra a month to use their bear proof trash cans. So there are oh. ways for people to get them. Uh, whether you want to pay for it yourself, we have some at the local hardware store if you just want to go buy one. There was a nationwide shortage for six months, which was part which of the problem. Which was a problem, yeah. Yeah. For quite a while. Uh, but now you can get them. Uh, and this <laughs> ordinance is going to be passed. It probably will sort of take place over time, which is to say it won't immediately everybody's got to have one because that's a lot of people who have to buy a pair of trash cans. So I think it's going to be a year or two sort of phase in process. But we're getting there. We're getting there. Maybe, um, you know, the goal was by this fall. We're not going to get there. But maybe by next fall, we'll have uh, more protected community for our local bear population, yeah. which would be great. Great. I think there's one last question. And it's this one. And I have to do it because it's a bird question. Yeah. And it's how many owls do we have in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? We have quite a few, and yeah. I'm going to try and remember oh, how we many we have. So, right. okay. <clears throat> we have Great Horned Owl. That one's obvious. One. We have Great Gray Owl. We have the Northern Sawwet Owl, which are adorable. They're tiny, and they look like butterflies when they fly. That's three. We have the Boreal Owl. We have the Northern Pygmy Owl. We have the Short-Eared Owl which is one of the few owls that you can actually find out in open country and broad daylight. Yeah, I've, I've never actually seen one. Yeah, yeah, I saw one this spring, actually. Oh, really? In Grand Teton, yeah, oh. on tour. Really? Um, oh, my God. We have, I need to just go on tour with him. <laughs> find all the birds. Uh, Long-eared owl. Right. Ooh, and then 
there is, I think, one or two records of a snowy owl. Yes. In Grand Teton yes, National there Park. there is. There's more than a few, actually, um, in certain years. All right. Can you think of any others? No. Because you're, we're too you're far the owl north expert, for barn owls, so. No, we don't have barn owls. We don't have barn owls. Yeah, we don't have barn owls. We don't have, let's see. No. We did burn owls. Oh, um. One bird that is super rare that I don't think a lot of birders think about is the western screech owl. Oh. Are we are we too far north? No, no, no. No, we have them, right? Yellowstone. Yep. Yeah, western They're screech owl. Do we get any eastern? I'm at nine. Owls? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think so. it's just western. Yeah. That's nine? Somebody will have nine. to check our math and see if there's yeah. one we're missing. So check us, do some research, maybe. This is like when we online. did how many weasels are there, and I was like, there's seven. And everybody's like, no, there's nine. Totally. You're totally wrong. There's a lot of weasels. <laughs> and some of them don't look like weasels. <laughs> And so, like, the next month, I was like, remember how I said there were seven? No, there's nine. <laughs> so, so check, check us. So, yeah. see if we got them all. <laughs> all right, guys. I think that's all we have time in terms of questions. But I really, really enjoy spending the first Wednesday of each month at mm -hmm. 530 Mountain Time with you all. I hope you enjoyed this month's video. Yeah. Thank you um, all for asking great questions yeah, and tuning great in. great questions. I liked mm -hmm. all the bird questions. That was really fun, too. It's exciting. I hope you all have a wonderful <laughs> August. We will see you next month. And in the meantime, if you find yourself in Jackson Hole, definitely stop by our office. Come say hi uh, and come out on tour with us. Yeah. All right. Best wishes. Thank you, guys.